Hi, Devin. Hi. Hi. Uh, my computer just decided to take a million years to turn my uh, yeah, um, video on. Um, all good. All good. Can you see um, Flavia or Mushkan? Um, Flavia and Mushkan are yeah, actually. Thank you, co host, too. So you can. Perfect. Hi, Flavia. Hi. Hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. Did you get my email? I, I know. I was did. Like, yes. Okay. Are you are you okay with that? Yeah, that's totally fine. I mean, I did want to ask because, you know, there's a few like things that maybe don't apply, like how organizations are promoting economic empowerment of young women at the grassroots like because in entertainment you know I could talk about how they support maybe uh young filmmakers or you know young young women that are starting out in that industry like with um different you know like different opportunities that are available to them now but it doesn't necessarily I, I wanted to make sure that you did understand that I'm speaking predominantly from the perspective of media production and entertainment and the, there's not a lot of like crossover. I do work in a nonprofit now, but in uh, as part of building their media department and kind of mm -hmm. building their storytelling department. So that's totally fine. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's totally fine. And Flavia, I want you to meet Mojgan, who's going to be our other speaker for today. So the two of you just have a sense. Um, yeah. So basically, um, we're going to start off with Devin, Saida, and I just sharing some updates about the YLYP program. Um, yeah. And really, this is just an opportunity for the participants on the call to reflect on the review theme of the commission. So okay. for, for you, Flavia and Mojgan, it's, you know, you sharing the work that you're doing, the things that um, inspire you, thinking about a vision for the future, particularly for young women and young people um, in their careers. So you'll share your dimensions and then we'll open it up um, to the floor to kind of share their thoughts as well. So it's a little informal. It's meant to be a space where people can connect and share and Okay. Experiences. So, yeah. So, you're saying you I shouldn't have done that two hour power presentation last night. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do you have hi, some Devin. <laughs> no, I don't have anything to share. Okay. I was just saying hi to Devin because she's usually, I've been in so many of the, the panels with her and not panels, um, Q and A's, and she's usually doing so much. So, yeah. it's nice to see her kind of like sitting and relaxing, I assume. <laughs> her, she's, she's about to like let people into the. <laughs> Into the call, so we're ready. I think, unless there are any questions at this point. Um, no. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. I'll let everybody in. First, let me do this. Okay. You can all see that, right? Okay. And, uh... Uh, okay, I'll let everyone in then. Welcome, welcome everyone. We're just taking a minute for everyone to call in and connect. Um, welcome to our Youth Leaders and Young Professionals event for today. The theme is the economic empowerment of women in the workplace. Um, we have a really wonderful program um, looking at this review theme of the Commission of, of the Status of Women coming up. So welcome to all who are joining. All right, so perhaps we can start. Um, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Safira. Um, I serve as one of the co-chairs for the Youth Leaders and Young Professionals Program of NGO CSW. Um, for those of you who are just joining, welcome. Feel welcome to introduce yourself in the chat. 
if you'd like to put your name, your organization and where you're calling in from today so we can have a sense of who's on the call. Um, and I'll hand over to Saida and then Devon, who are the other co-chairs of the YOYPs to introduce themselves and, and share some of our updates um, in terms of what's happening with YLYPs right now. So over to you, Saida. Thank you, Safira. Hi, everyone. I'm Saida Rizvi. I'm one of the co-chairs of NGOCSW's Young Leaders and Young Professionals Program. And just to provide you a little bit of context about this space, uh, we are hosting this preparatory series uh, to build momentum towards CSW, which is just a few short weeks away. Um, and this is really a space where every Wednesday we come together at noon uh, East Coast time to connect, to build a network, to support engagement at CSW and understand how to engage effectively as young people uh, across the globe. Uh, each week we have a different topic of discussion and different, and different events. We have the youth preparation series timings and events listed out here. Um, and next week, of course, we have our male allyship event um, on the same time again on Friday, 23rd February at noon, P at noon East Coast time. And we're excited to see you all again there. And of course, with CSW being, again, just a few short weeks away, we are continuing to celebrate the 50th anniversary of NGO CSW. Um, and we have a kudo board available for you to add your memories um, about CSW and your vision for a gender equitable world. I can drop the link to that kudo board in the chat here so you all can have access to it. It's already pretty full. I see that Great Grace has already got that in there. Thank you. But again, it's just a space for you to share your vision, your thoughts, any fun pictures uh, that you might have or, or just, just, just what you want to share with this global community uh, about celebrating NGOCSW and the work we've been doing for many, many decades to build a more equitable world for all. Um, to share a little bit more about how we can continue to engage uh, at NGOCSW and beyond and are more about our preparatory series for young people at CSW, I'm going to turn it over to Devin. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah. Thanks for those introductions, Fira and Saida. Um, yeah, so I think the next big thing for us is we are co-hosting a um, event this uh, Friday. The date on this flyer is wrong. We just <laughs> updated the flyer. So it's 18th of February, not January. Um, but it's essentially going to be a workshop on everything that you need to know about um, the CSW 66 um, priority theme, which is climate change. Um, so we will be sending a email to our mailing list with um, all the information today. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and we'll also put the registration link in the chat for you as well. Um, so that's this Friday at 8.30 Eastern, um, so New York time. And then the other thing that's happening is this Thursday at 1 p.m. New York time, we will be having a um, general training on all things NGO CSW 66 forum. Um, so definitely don't miss that if you're planning on attending. Um, we're gonna go over the different aspects of the forum. Um, I'm gonna do a quick walkthrough of the virtual portal um, where the forum is hosted. You'll hear from our chair from the forum co-chairs and we'll have a QA and a session at the end. Um, so definitely don't miss that. Um, and it'll also be recorded and shared and disseminated um, afterwards if you can't make it or if you want to review it after the event. Um, and I'll put the registration link for that in the chat as well. And um, the only other thing is really to just register for the forum. Um, I think Grace will put these uh, links in the chat for me. We do have a lot of great resources for y'all um, to just help you um, navigate the forum, the virtual portal. Um, we do have like a tutorial video series on our YouTube channel. Um, so check out all those resources on our YouTube and on our website. Um, and the last thing are our global mentors for youth leaders. We had our first mentorship meet and greet um, last week or two weeks ago at some point. <laughs> um, 
where we it was um, just an informal space for everyone to get to know each other, talk about different issues and topics, um, meet our different mentors. Um, we we really want these mentorship um, relationships to be meaningful um, and uh, continue for a long time. So um, feel free to check out the um, global mentors that we have on our website. Um, the website is down here and I think Grace will put that in the chat as well. Um, our next um, meet and greet event will happen during the CSW during the second week. Um, so that'll be on Wednesday the 23rd. Same time as all of our other events, 12 to 2 p.m. Um, and we um, will be sending uh, emails and information about that and the registration links as well as always. Um, yeah, I think that's it for me. Um, and I'll hand it back over to Safira. Thank you so much, Devin and Saida. So I know that was a lot in terms of updates, but we really did wanna give you um, just a quick update as to what's happening. Um, with YLYP. So those chat, those links are in the chat and we'll share them again towards the end of the meeting. For those who've just joined, welcome. Um, so we're going to uh, transition into the main theme of our event together today. Um, and many of you who are familiar with the Commission on the Status of Women will know that each year there is a priority theme and there's also a, a review theme. And so the priority theme of the Commission on the Status of Women this year is around climate change, the environment, disaster risk reduction. And some of you may have joined for that event where we did explore that theme. But today we're going to be exploring the review theme. And this is a theme from around five years ago um, from CSW 61, which was held in 2017. And this is where the Commission um, looked at the, the topic of the economic empowerment of women in the changing world of work. And so what happens with a review theme is that the commission is going to evaluate the progress made on implementing the agreed conclusions from that commission five years ago. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the chat um, the link to those agreed conclusions. So you can take a look, those who are not so familiar or, um, you know, who uh, are just kind of getting up to speed with what happened five years ago at the commission. I know not all of us were around at that time. Um, but basically what happened there is that those agreed conclusions kind of set out some steps um, to overcome inequalities, discrimination, barriers that women face in the current world of work, and to look at what action is needed to ensure that women can take the full advantage of opportunities that are arising in the workplace. And so in summary, just to give like a very brief summary of what was agreed there, um, the commission kind of agreed that governments and other stakeholders would look at seven areas. And I'll just name them very quickly. They're just to kind of trigger some thoughts for you as you're, you're thinking about this review theme. So they were looking at strengthening normative and legal frameworks um, around education, training and skill development, economic and social policies for women and women's economic empowerment, looking at the growing informality of work and the mobility of women workers, managing technological and digital change, looking at women's collective voice, leadership and decision-making and strengthening the role of the private sector in women's economic empowerment. And so thank you to Devin for putting those in the chat. Um, and so what we're wanting to do together today is to just really share and explore this review theme. It will be spoken um, of at the CSW, you will see it in the plenary sessions, but also I'm sure there'll be many um, side events and parallel events also looking at the progress made. Um, and in five years, if we look at what humanity has gone through in the past five years, a lot has happened. We are emerging from a global pandemic, which has really shifted a lot of the ways that young people especially have had access to education, how they're accessing work and livelihoods, um, especially young people working in the informal sector and what has happened to their jobs, um, moving online, working from home, this kind of digital divide that has happened um, for people around the world. Um, climate change is also a very, very topical issue for young people right now. And so this is a space for us together to reflect um, 
based on our own lived experiences, um, what has happened in terms of the economic situation for young women and young people, um, and just kind of where we are at this moment based on, on this theme of economic empowerment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put um, four questions in the chat and we will have a chance to kind of open the floor and um, kind of explore these questions together. And I'll just read them. So what has been the experience of young women and young people entering the workforce in these past five years? What are organizations doing to support the transition of young people into professional spaces? How are organizations promoting the economic empowerment of women at the grassroots? And what are young people envisioning for their work and careers in the future? So this is something we, we're hoping that all of us who are on the call today can um, share some thoughts. You're welcome to put thoughts in the chat or, or raise your hand and, and speak to these questions. Um, but to get the ball rolling, we have invited two speakers to share their thoughts. So um, we have Flavia from Girl Rising and we have Mojgan from the Baha'i International Community who will share for about five minutes each some of their thoughts and experiences, the work that they're doing, their vision for the future. Um, and then we will open the floor to kind of explore this review theme together. So with that, I will hand over to Flavia to get us started. Flavia, if you'd like to just introduce yourself and say a little bit about the work um, that you're involved in, and then we'll hear from Mujgan and then we'll open the floor. So over to you, Flavia. Hi, thank you so much and, and nice to meet everyone, nice to see everyone. My name is Flavia Malungi. I am the program producer for Girl Rising's Future Rising Initiative. Um, this is a new storytelling program designed to drive investment and support for girls' education. I oversee the Future Rising Fellowship, which is a year-long virtual program that supports young leaders between the ages of 17 and 24 who are working at the intersection of gender equity and environmental justice. In fact, we just opened applications for the second cohort. So anyone who fits that criteria and is interested in applying, I'll provide some information at the end. I'm also a founding member and creative director for Call Sheets to Cocktails or C2C. It's a professional networking organization. We're a team of four women, all women of color who work in the media and entertainment industry. We host networking and learning events for young women who are interested in a career in media. Um, in the past, we've hosted events that um, tackle career advancement, financial literacy, resume building, gender and race discrimination, um, professional networking, and mental health in the workplace. Um, I'll also forward some information about that if anyone wants to be a part of any events we have upcoming in 2022. So the first point, um, well, when, when I reached, when I saw this, um, this session, I reached out to um, CSW because, you know, advocating for women's economic empowerment in the workplace is a passion of mine. You know, I've professionally benefited from the advice and mentorship of women throughout my entire career who have empowered me to advocate for myself. And so I'm always looking for opportunities to pay it forward, either through C2C or personally by mentoring um, young women myself. Uh, the first point about the experiences of young women in entertain in um, a young women entering the workforce. So I focus predominantly on media and entertainment. And in my personal experiences and through conversations I've had with friends and at C2C events, you know, simply entering the workforce is one of the biggest hurdles for young women getting through the door. Um, the entertainment industry is notoriously a boys club. So it's very hard for young women starting out um, who don't have any experience because unlike their male peers who get hired by their friends or are allowed to, um, and are allowed to learn on the job, it's hard for young women to get an interview, you know, or even hear about a job. If you work in an industry where everyone only hires who they've previously worked with and the industry is dominated by men, it's, it creates like an unfortunate cycle that continuously excludes women from these opportunities. And I don't think that's just in the entertainment industry. I think that's very global, unfortunately. Um, and in addition, you know, men are allowed to make mistakes. You know, they're, you know, they're allowed to fail at projects and it's viewed as a learning curve. But women who are starting out, you know, you hear these 
directors or writers with a movie that bombs or a TV show that doesn't have a lot of ratings, it's that failed project is often viewed as confirmation of their lack of, you know, adequate talent. Um, and it's rare that they get opportunities to, um, to, to work again. And that narrative gets even worse for women of color. So when I think about the experiences of young women entering the workforce, I just think of how difficult it is for them to even get through the door in my industry and how I'm, I work and advocate to create more opportunities for them to network with each other so that they can hire themselves and kind of expand that, that pool. The next point about what institutions are doing to transition young people into professional spaces, you know, like, like in other industries, um, we're, we're in an interesting time where there's like a, a hybrid of in-person and remote work. I think it's really interesting, young people who are starting out, I've worked and I work a lot with recent graduates who have never been in an office or on a set and they're having to, you know, they're really craving that experience. And I'm not really seeing a lot of specific action being done by organizations in entertainment to sort of transition people who have graduated and only worked remote and haven't had really these interpersonal experiences to help them once they enter the workforce, because it is a learning curve, you know, when you work with other people or versus working remote, you really learn how to work differently. And I think it would benefit the industry overall to really incorporate steps of um, helping young, young people adapt and learn how to work um, outside of remote work. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see how that evolves as well. Um, the next point about how organizations are promoting the economic empowerment of young women at grassroots levels. Um, so in, in the entertainment industry, you know, between the Me Too movement and sort of the Black Lives Matter movement or um, um, Stop Asian Hate movement, you know, it's created the ripple effect of that has been kind of a, a desire for hearing people's um, to see people tell their own stories. And that push has really created a lot of interest, opportunity and funding for young creatives to have access to jobs they didn't have in the past to be able to tell their own stories to um, because you know, now everyone looks at a film when the first thing they see, if it's a story about a specific community, is that director from that community? Is the cast from that community? Um, are, is, if, is the behind the scenes crew from that community? And that sort of investigative um, push from the audience to, to see the, the people who are making the projects or also reflect what the project is about has really changed the industry, in my opinion, and given, and given a lot of opportunities to people that who didn't have them before. So I, that's the, the only way, that's the way I can see how um, this question about like grassroots kind of applies to the entertainment industry. Um, and the last point about, and that, that goes the same you know, for, for women working in entertainment, it's really created an avenue for women to have more opportunities as well. Um, and then how young people are envisioning their work and careers in the future. This is really interesting to me, um, it's not just in entertainment, um, but I really, the, the, the more I work with young people, the more I see a theme of them not really waiting for permission um, not really waiting for permission to start their own businesses, to tell their own stories, to advocate for themselves. Um, when I was starting out in, uh, in my career, you know, access was a really big thing. And there were very specific steps that you had to take to sort of, you know, you, to, to get certain types of access. And now I see young people just you know, there's so many um, different platforms for them to create, distribute and promote their work that it's really removed this idea of gatekeepers in a way um, on the industry level on um, that has led to richer content, has led to richer stories, more authentic stories and across all types of media, you know, from film to TV to writing to it, to everything. And I'm really excited to see how that evolves and I'm gonna wrap up really quickly, but I just wanted to touch base that even, you know, even in my current role at Girl Rising and the Future Rising Fellowship, we're seeing that as well. Um, funders, partners, anyone that's sort of interested in what we're doing, 
the part that they're interested in is that we're trying to get these stories about the intersection of gender equity and climate change from the people who it impacts directly. We're, we're, if we're telling a story about a girl in India, it's told by that girl in India. If we're telling a story about, you know, child marriage in Nigeria, it's told from someone who lives in that community. So it's sort of removed the lack of um, authenticity that maybe used to exist. It's, it's removed this idea that only a certain type of person, you know, usually white and wealthy and from the West can articulate and tell these stories. And it's allowed opportunities, beautiful opportunities for people to kind of like own their own voice and advocate for themselves and and in um, and, and their communities. So I think it's gonna be, I think there's like a reckoning and I'm really excited to see how that evolves across all industries. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Flavia. Yeah, some really wonderful points that you raised there and just also really exciting like to hear this, this vision that you have for the future and how things are changing yeah. for like to facilitate more equitable, authentic, um, to give voice to those stories on the ground in, in more just and equal ways. So thank you so much for sharing those points. And I'm, I'm sure others, um, other participants on the call today, it's triggered some, some thoughts for everyone too. So looking forward to hearing any reactions to what Flavia has shared. So with that, we will turn to Mojgan um, to offer some thoughts. If you'd like to just introduce yourself, Mojgan, and, and share some Thoughts on the questions, a little bit of your own personal experience and your vision for the future. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you to Safira and all the organizers for having me. Um, so my name is Mojgan. I am a youth representative at the Baha'i International Community in New York. I thought I could start by sharing a bit about my background and what led me to work at the Baha'i offices. So I have a bachelor's degree in gender and women's studies and have always been passionate about gender issues and the advancement of women. So one of the focus areas of our office and my work in particular is youth and gender equality. So as the daughter of an entrepreneur and business owner, I was introduced to the workplace at a very early age. My sister and I were given responsibilities that most employers don't give to young people or even women. We were taking on leadership roles, delegating tasks, and managing multiple projects. Unfortunately, my experiences do not reflect the reality of most young women who are transitioning into the workforce. My experiences did, however, allow me to envision what is possible when young women are given the opportunity to lead and make decisions in professional spaces. These principles within business, where men and women are given equal opportunities and the potential of young people is recognized, gave me the confidence to contribute meaningfully in professional spaces going forward and actually led me to my current role as a youth representative. So I believe that the principles that are implemented in the workplace in which young women are entering sets the precedent for their future contributions. I also believe it is the responsibility of those in positions of power to welcome and seek out the contributions of women and youth, recognizing that the progress of future generations depends on their full participation. So I wanted to share a bit about a side event that my office held this morning for the Commission for Social Development titled The Future of Work, Consulting Across Generations to Build Prosperity. So the purpose of our event was to have an intergenerational dialogue on the purpose of work beyond the acquisition of material means. So while the economic empowerment of young women is something to definitely strive for, I think it's important to look beyond just economics. The path from doubt to self-confidence, from passivity to action, and from discouraged to empowered cannot be understood only in terms of entering the labor market. The development of capacity must consider all aspects of human existence, economic as well as social, intellectual, cultural, spiritual, and moral. At the root of countless barriers to women and girls entering and advancing in professional spaces is a refusal to embrace the reality that women and men are equal and that all human beings are one. For its part, the worldwide Baha'i community has been striving to learn about the role that knowledge plays in the advancement of society. The creation of spaces and systems for consultation that draws on the experience of many and values the knowledge that each has to offer at any given point opens pathways for universal participation and is indispensable to the processes of enduring social change. 
We are living in a time where so much is changing at such a rapid pace. The past two years have laid bare and exacerbated worldwide challenges across a number of sectors, but they have also created conditions for compassion, solidarity, and cooperation. In many places, young women have moved to the forefront of grassroots responses to the health crisis. While the impacts of COVID-19 remain prevalent, each individual is prompted to consider how best to navigate a changing work landscape and contribute meaningfully to society. And this is all the more true for younger generations who will bear a greater share of the effects of decisions made today. So how do all these elements come together to create the future of work for the next generation of people? I'm hoping to continue this conversation on the advancement of youth and the advancement of women during our upcoming youth series, which our office is hoping to launch on April 22nd. So we're hoping to use this space to articulate what it means to have meaningful contributions of young people in various discourses. Of course, you are all invited um, and our office would be so happy if you could join us. So stay tuned for updates. I'll also include my email in the chat. So feel free to reach out to me. Um, that concludes my remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mushkan, for sharing your own experience and your own beginning, that opportunity that you had to really step into some of these leadership roles um, in a meaningful way. And love, love to hear more. Um, if you put the information in the chat about the youth series that is coming up, I'm sure um, many on the call would like to join and participate there. So with that, um, with thanks to both of our speakers getting the ball rolling, we can open up the floor. Um, you're welcome to raise your electronic hand or just turn on your video and indicate that you would like to speak. Um, you're also welcome to continue to build on comments in the chat. Um, but this is really an opportunity for all of us as you know, members of the Youth Leaders and Young Professionals program. We've been really wanting to develop this space as a network, um, as, as a, a group of people who are interested in these issues around gender equality, youth and engaging at the commission that we can get to know each other and hear a bit about what each of us are working on um, and to be able to support one another through the commission and beyond. Um, so this is an opportunity for you to just share. You're welcome to address some of the questions that were put in the chat. Perhaps we can put those questions um, again if you would like to share your experience of entering the workplace in the past five years, or even if you just wanted to share your vision for the future and um, what you're hoping um, for the dynamics of a future workplace um, for yourself to look like, you're very welcome to share. Um, so with that, the floor is open. And thank you, Devin, for sharing the questions on the screen. Um, so welcome to jump in. This is the part where it takes somebody to raise their hand <laughs> and have a little courage to share. This is your opportunity. I know that in the online world, we get used to webinars. We get used to just sitting back and, and listening to other people speak. And so we're really consciously trying to create the space in our youth leaders and young professionals where this is not a webinar format. This is a, a format where we can engage with each other and speak with each other. So I know it's a little bit out of our comfort zone, but um, it would be great to hear from, from those who would like to share. So I see a few hands. Um, we can start with Jivika, then Emily, and then Keisha. So over to you, Jivika. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to speak in the context of the Global South a little bit. And uh, can you just put the questions back up? It will be really helpful. Or oh, they're in the chat as well. That's fine. I'll look at them in the chat. So I think just to contextualize um, a little bit, when we and I come from India, I've been working with rural women and young gender diverse people and girls for the past 10 years, looking at issues of justice, looking at issues of economic empowerment, unpaid and paid work, looking at agriculture, which is where most young people, especially women and girls, are located in my country. Um, so just, I mean, I think what's happened is that there's been this whole push towards um, skilling and 
you know, towards new age skills and all of that, which is very little bit of the global south actually goes into that space and less for women and girls, right? So your investment in spaces where uh, women and girls have access has been very little, which is around the rural economy, social protection around that has been very low uh, in countries like us. And I think um, even where there's investment in young girls coming into, I mean, young people coming into the workforce, especially women, um, allied services are very low. So services around violence, protection in the workplace, decent work, equal pay, you know, so those are some of the struggles that we do see. And I think when we speak about workplaces, we need to start addressing those issues if we have to look at what's happening at the grassroots and investment funding programs, models, um, you know, all the trials. So it's something we keep saying in the Economic Justice Action Coalition as young people as well, where, you know, the largest programs with uh, women are economic programs in the global south, but how? Who are? What are we investing in? To what we call the ba livelihood basket, right? Like moving just from work to looking at livelihood holistically, and where do women and girls fit into this? Um, so I think that's something we need. You know, while we are looking at the corporate formal workspace in or professional workspace, I think uh, in countries like ours, ninety-two percent of the workforce is in, in informal economies, and I can speak for South Asia and Asia to say that's true across. So that's one concern, and I think. How do you also uh, build networks, support such um, conversations, and how do you allow young people to decide what their workspaces look like, right? And within that, women also to define it. Are they part of policy making that invests in these? You know, what is what is being invested in, what is being decided, and you know, who's setting the agenda? And all of this cannot be spoken about without social protection. Um, you know, and also addressing unpaid both care and non-care work. Uh, you know, so I think just expanding the debate to that a little bit from just leadership within formal spaces, which for my country is only five to 10%. Anyway, the rest of them are all in the informal economy. So, yeah. Thank you. Some great points. Thank you so much for, for raising those, Jivika. And yeah, extending that conversation to the global south and the, the lived experience um, of those outside the formal sector. Absolutely. Okay, I'll hand over to Emily. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And thank you so much for putting this together. It's really exciting to be here. Um, I had briefly mentioned in the chat that my organization is um, hosting a parallel event with NGO CSW, and it is directly related to the economic empowerment of women. So I just wanted to uh, share that as it pertains to you know, grassroots initiatives to economically empower women and get them in the workplace. Um, I'm a part of the National Federation of Business and Professional Women's Clubs, huge name, um, we're NFBPW or BPW for short. And our um, chapter in New York City started an initiative, which is now a national project to help the displaced Afghan women who have arrived in the US um, and we've left room for it to evolve into a um, program to help all immigrant women uh, to say, come to the US. We realized that as you know, many have mentioned in here, it's been addressed that there really aren't very many support systems to help professional women get into um, business within the US, especially migrant women. So our organization has created this, this project to help um, transfer any any uh, skills and certifications and prevent that career backslide. And, uh, you know, just, just an example of a grassroots organization and a grassroots movement at the local level, trying to empower women economically and get them, break those barriers into the workplace. And uh, this one is in, you know, a specific group of, of migrant women. Um, but again, yeah, we're, we're hosting our event on March 16th, and I would love to see everyone there. Um, I'll put the link to our project's website in the chat if anyone wants to check it out and learn more information. I also posted my uh, LinkedIn in the chat as well if anyone would like to connect. Uh, once again, thank you so much for, for hosting this. I'm so excited to be here, be addressing these really important issues. Thank you so much, Emily, for sharing that and sharing the, the important work that your organization is doing, particularly with migrant women. That was really wonderful to hear. And um, we, we did want to kind of have a platform that supports 
the efforts of the Youth Leaders and Young Professionals uh, Network. So if you are hosting um, events during the CSW and you would like to share them, we have a Slack channel that you can join. Please post your flyers there, information about the event, registration links, because um, it will be nice to support one another's events and get, and get the word out. So thank you so much for sharing that. All right, I'll hand the floor to Keisha. Thank you, Sakina. I was so excited to be here. And every week we get to discuss something or meet new people. So thank you so much for organizing this. Um, I actually wanted to speak to the first two um, questions because um, through personal experience, I'm 25 years old and I did join the workforce in the middle of this pandemic. So I finished uh, my education in this and started working as well. And I was working two jobs because um, I just felt like to make the most of it during the pandemic. So one was online and one was offline. And I live in Mumbai, it's a metropolitan city in India. We have a lot of opportunities, which, um, and we don't, we're not so, we don't lack exposure as much uh, or so it would seem. And, um, during the pandemic, um, in one, so I was working at a law firm, and it's a comparatively um, old practice following kind of, um, you could say, industry, where many times my seniors would tell me things like, I don't know why you're working so hard. You know, uh, you're going to get married and you're going to have your own family. So I don't know why you're working so hard and trying to um, create this career because you're going to have to give it up. And um, and this is more to what Mojgan said about, it's not just economic empowerment, it's also about feeling empowered and women feeling empowered. Because I was also working at a startup, which is a new age startup with a little bit more of a modern sense of thinking, where they did believe and they supported things like this, where I was trying to do and learn a new thing. So I feel that many times we don't realize this, but women are expected to be the caretakers to look after the home, especially in our country. So it's not just the economic empowerment of it, it's also how the women feel or are made to feel sometimes. Um, at our foundation, the Kunne Foundation, we work with a lot of children who live in the slums or the streets of Mumbai. And Many of them are living below the internationally accepted poverty line. Um, their access to education is very different from mine. So if I went to a private school and went to some of the top colleges of my city and uh, actually not just my city, my country, I was told after graduating from there, if I was told things like, why are you working on your career? And why is it so important to you? Um, I also know the children that I work with, they face this on a daily basis where it's not just about, oh, you'll get married. It's a, it's For many of them, it's a reality that they will get married off very, very soon. We do have children who do have to leave their education and get married. So we do, at the foundation, try to work towards creating some, you know, um, empowerment in their minds, not just, you know, um, educationally, but even what they feel about themselves. Um, and that's something that we have seen. And in the pandemic, when everyone was locked away and in their homes, we have seen a huge uh, lack of access to education, to resources, to exposure. And a lot of work that we had also done in the previous years was slowed down and turned back in many ways because of the pandemic and now we're reworking that. So um, on the 17th of March, we do have a presentation and we'll put the details in of how through peer-to-peer um, -peer mentorship, we did try to create and bridge this gap of education, of opportunity, of exposure with our children. So that, because this we realize it's not just something that affects young women, but also young men, but much more uh, for young women. So, um, it's great to have these conversations and to bring these to light, to find new solutions in which we can help young women all around the world. So thank you so much for this platform. Thank you so much, Keisha, for those points and, and really important to kind of look at the holistic 
picture of things and this balance of career and family life and cultural expectations and kind of all the other things that go into navigating um, steps around a livelihood and, and a career. So thank you so much for sharing also that your organization is having an event and some of the work that you've been involved in. That's really wonderful. Thank All right. you. Thank you. I'm going to hand the floor to Mohammed. Over to you. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Everybody's over here today. And I'm from the same organization as Keisha, who just spoke, Karna Foundation. I'm a youth change maker over there. And um, very well um, based by both of our speakers today. With, um, Flavia and Morgan both spoke about you. You know, um, youth not waiting for permission. That means uh, youth are stepping up more and uh, giving their best over here. Also, if you see, there are a lot of youth from our organization who have stepped up um, and sharing what work we do. And as Keisha said, that we are empowering young male and female to have certain skills which are highly valuable in the market right now. And um, as we all are, even I am in my college right now, I'm in my final year of graduation. And my own peers, uh, we all are learning together and uh, we are creating a base, um, an, um, you can say an environment of support. Um, and um, we are also sensitizing young male. So even if we see for, as Keisha said, as a lot of speakers told today, that even in the, even the workspace, there are a lot of biases on females. So we even sensitize young male like me, myself, um, like how to respect women and how to keep an equitable platform, which we totally believe in. And uh, myself, whatever I am today, I have some powerful women who have my back because of which I am speaking here today. <laughs> um, so yes, we do believe in an equitable platform and we do believe that this equi equitable platform should expand more and more. And uh, we too are presenting on this uh, 17th of March. Our topic is dis COVID disaster relief through peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. And I am too one of the speakers along with my PO, Priya. Um, so hoping to see you all, we'll go, we are going to touch a lot of these points over there and uh, it's going to be interesting and hope to see you all there and hope to see you all over here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Mohammed. And yeah, great to, to hear your, your thinking around these biases in the workplace, how to respect women, how to build that equitable platform. That's fantastic. All right, I see Fred has something to add. Over to you, Fred. Hi, um, really great um, speaking and, and engaging ideas uh, to talk about. Um, related to the first, that, and what was mentioned later about working at a startup, you know, there's certain cultures that men and women. So a man up campaign, we have a, engagement framework, gender, sports, music, art, election, and technology, so I think Fred, it seems like you're cutting in and out. We're, we're catching certain words and now we can't hear you. I don't know whether you can come closer to the microphone. Anyway, I think, you know, a lot of what needs to be done is over at the UN, we could do a lot of policy. You know, we can work on C190 and get those frameworks and make them available. We have to work. Fred, it seems we've lost you. You've, you've just cut out. And kind of more soft efforts to make workplaces where we can facilitate uh, gender equality, especially in technology and um, like theater, uh, film. There's a lot of these projects that are kind of both voluntary and commercial, um, especially like you would say, a bunch of actors are not working. A lot of times a good way to get into the industry or get into film is to create you know, a, a film or a project, and then start to, to make that happen. 
the same thing in entrepreneurship, but I find it's very, very, really hard, you know, for men and women to negotiate and uh, these role, work roles, what are these things? And so I think we, you know, really need to work together on some of these projects, you know, where we start to change culture. We start to bring out dimensions like people's strengths in different aspects and so that they can really start to understand, you know, we're all human beings. Uh, we have to even up the, the playing field in some ways and make people think and behave differently. So anyway, I think uh, it's really great, this discussion and hope to continue to discuss. And, um, you know, we'd love to, if anybody wants to mentor, I've been asked to be in this program. And so, um, you know, it, it'd be great to have you Thank you so much, Fred. Thank you. Yes, and I know the connection wasn't so strong, but maybe just to shout out, Fred is serving as one of our global mentors for YLYP. Um, he's with the Man Up campaign and just wanted to echo some of the things that we did hear, Fred, um, this idea of culture change in the startup world with technology in, and all the way through to the arts like theater and film and in the range of projects that are voluntary all the way through to the commercial. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm sure there'll be um, some of the call who might, who might like to connect with you and um, moving forward. All right, so I see Mamiki has a hand. I don't, hope I pronounced your name right, but please, the floor is yours, go ahead. Um, afternoon, everybody. Well, good evening from South Africa. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, answer a few of the questions that have been asked and my experience as a young woman in South Africa uh, going into the workforce, South Africa is one of the countries with a great number um, of unemployment, especially youth unemployment. So having completed my studies, there was a sense of anxiety as to I am a young black woman in South Africa where there is in the inequality, where am I going to get in employment? You know, where do I start? So there was a sense of anxiety as to so many people already do not have jobs. People that have completed their studies way ahead of me do not have jobs. So how am I going to start? And I think, as the lady said before, the one of the previous speakers spoke about it being not just about empowerment economically, but also overall empowerment as in, am I confident enough with the past of my country, the past of what I've been told and how I grew up um, that I cannot be in certain spaces? How do I then empower myself? And with the communities that I live within, I've never been told that I can be greater than what I am. So I think empowerment is a, is a holistic way of looking at things. And as previous speakers spoke about, um, it being looking at our environments and how we grow, uh, how we grew up. Um, so unpaid care work, uh, the fact that we still need to look to take care of our families and still try and empower ourselves in terms of the workplace, going into the workplace. And, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot as a young person and transitioning from that thing of that you you just a, a somebody in their studies and then going into the workplace. How do you empower yourself when you're already tired because of unpaid care work? Um, so it's a, it's a, you need to, we need to look at it in a holistic manner. And I think my anxieties with unemployment in my country has been the biggest thing for me, but luckily um, I've been volunteering for about nine years. So even before I completed my high school, um, I was volunteering and to a point where now I work for, for the NGO. So I work for Africa Dukun, which is, um, which offers skills development. So it's a, it's a model of cradle to career. So they hone you from ECD until they place you into your career. So working with young people now, specifically from 18 to 21 years old, 
um, in very poor com communities. So I work in the township of Alexandra under the Youth Accelerator Program at Africa Dukun. And just to hear their stories as to they have to wake up in the morning, take care of somebody before they come there. Um, they grew up in, in poor, very poor uh, backgrounds. They, they do not have as much um, access to opportunity as somebody that comes from next door, a neighboring um, town. So it's quite sad to look at that. So many young women have the potential, however, they do not have access uh, because of economic situations, um, because of social situations, um, because they were not even groomed to be that kind of person. They were not groomed to say that, you know what, you, you actually have a chance to go to university after you finish. They are not even exposed to other information such as you can go for traineeships, you can go for learnerships, you don't need to go directly to tertiary. So they give up just before they can even get that opportunity. And when we speak about grassroots um, uh, projects. This is one of it, like um, the youth accelerator program that we have at Africa Dukun, uh, where we do offer 18 to 21 year old skills to go into whether they want to go into work, the workplace, or whether they want to go into um, tertiary or they want to start their businesses and be entrepreneurs. We give them those skills, those basic skills, because even looking at our schooling system, uh, I think it fails most of them. It's just a way, a practical, a practical way to say that, you know what, 12 years of your, of your life, you study something. However, there's no critical um, thinking when it comes to it. So we focus on ensuring that they get those critical skills, such as good communication skills, confidence as well you know, presenting themselves in an articulate manner. And it, it doesn't really need to be because of the way they speak, but because they are confident in what they're doing. So, yeah. And uh, I think also involvement as young people, involvement in advocacy, young people, a lot, a lot of young people feel disempowered that they cannot go into their communities and make a change because they feel like they've been there for too long and things have not changed. So what change will they bring at this point where things have gone, you know, they, they're in a dire situation at that point. So we, we ensure that we encourage them to go into communities and participate in community work as well, to identify problems and be the change that they want to see, not just wait for government to come by. So I think those are the important things that we address. We are also part, I'm also part of Young Urban Women South Africa. I'm a secretary for that um, uh, program that we run by, that is run by Action Aid in partnership with Africa Dukun. So we address such issues as such as uh, decent work and uh, sexual and reproductive health rights, GBV, economic justice for young people as well. So I think youth should be more involved in such conversations and it is important to share regardless of our backgrounds and what we do and in, in our positions yeah thank you so much for sharing that yeah some really excellent points and i love this idea that you know this connection to community that we are in certain contexts and certain environments um but that we're reading our reality and we're being that change we're making that change we're not kind of waiting for someone else to come in and do it for us but that young people can really step up and do that um, and community can, can support that process. Thank you so much. I will hand the floor to Sakina, over to you. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'm Sakina and I'm calling from Rajasthan, India. Um, so as uh, Kishan Mohammed uh, spoke uh, earlier, I, I come from the same organization, the Kurnik Foundation. Um, so my experience uh, has been as such that uh, I believe that youth can empower youth uh, in a much better way than anyone else can. So um, if a youth, when I look at my peers, I am inspired to work and the kind of bond that we share, uh, the kind of experiences that we have shared together, I think that empowers us more than anyone else could. 
so uh, when i look into my country and the organization that i am working with there are a lot of uh, girls that come to our organization as participants and they are forced into early marriages because they do not come from a very econom uh, they do not come from a strong economic background so uh, they do not really have access to a lot of resources a lot of opportunities and uh, speaking about myself so even i was hesitating a lot i i come from i believe that a better i'm 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 more privileged than my other peers in the organization but still i lack confidence so i wasn't so confident enough to you know raise my hand initially and speak about it but um, but there are other other participants in my organization who i feel are even lesser confident because there has been a language gap so since i was in a private school i got the opportunity to study in english and uh, today i can communicate with all of you because i have i have a uh, i have a hold on the language and you all can understand me on the other hand my peers they do not come from the similar background so most of them they were not even taught uh, the main core subjects in the global language english so today when they are um, when they go for the job uh, when they go for the corporate world the opportunities and everything everything is very limited for them um, so we are just trying to you know um, make an equitable platform provide an equitable pro uh, platform for everyone so that you know uh, women do not lack these opportunities when they uh, go for uh, their career when they step out in the real world um and it's not just for women uh, uh, it's equally important for both male and males and females to um, have an equitable platform uh, so that they can represent themselves and they can have a better life and you know uh, if one person steps up an entire generation can change so um we at kone foundation we believe in youth to youth empowerment and it's a completely youth based model so we we are really uh, open to all the youth and like uh, um so the educational program that we are doing is is empowering the youth and uh, we have the parallel event which would be really exciting for all of you if you would like to join it is on 17th march at 4 pm est and the uh, the title of the event is covid disaster relief through peer to peer youth mentorship yeah thank you so much for this opportunity once again fantastic thank you so much sakina for having the courage to to share and to this point that that you're right there is something that's very unique about young people inspiring one another and empowering one another um and sharing that experience together and and so it's wonderful to hear of what your organization is learning and i mean in terms of this space as yoyps would love to um implement some of that here as well to kind of support and inspire one another and share these experiences together so thank you so much i see kajal has a hand over to you yes thank you so much i couldn't stop smiling when every speaker was sharing their uh, personal experience and it's so amazing to be here and learn the whole global perspective it's amazing thank you so much for that so i'm also from the same foundation karne foundation so thank you mohammed kisha and sakina for setting the base for me to speak thank you so much so the people they spoke about the children they are helping the other side of the bridge who are less privileged who are getting married really early that's that's me that's one of me is getting married really early uh, i am one of those children who is getting less privileged who is less privileged or not having a, like perfect english to go into a career so i'm really glad that i joined karne foundation and there i'm learning so much and i have the courage to come over here and speak to all of you all and i have the supporting system behind me so they encourage me and allow me to do whatever i would like to go ahead with 
so that's one thing the another thing is i want to share that i'm in my second year of law school and i have not uh, joined the workforce yet but i see that children who live in slums if i say that i want to become a lawyer i want to become an engineer i want to become something of not very which is not a women led organization or the it's not women led like a doctor is very nurse is women led thing but if i say i want to become something different it's a like a you cannot become they are really scared that how do you want to go in a law force that's all like men are going to be there and how are you going to survive there uh, they are going to demand anything from you like so many questions come so and the vision is that i can do what i want to do i can join the law force i co- i can go into justice system so this is the vision i have for my country for around the world the women who are suffering i want them to have their choice that what they want to do do they can do the society does not need to tell them like what they can do or what they cannot do i feel and thirdly i i just have so many points inside me so i'm just <laughs> going ahead please just give me two more minutes please so also um i wanted to say that women are doing women are capable they can achieve greater things it's just that we need the opportunities and we need that support that we are capable and we want someone to believe even if you don't believe in us it's fine just do not constantly say that you cannot do this or this is what you're made for and all of that things that would really really help i feel yes we are also presenting in the march so please come and join us for our presentation thank you thank you kajal it's a wonderful to have so many of you on the call and to hear hear each of you speak this is fantastic um and i just wanted to echo this last piece that you shared i mean the the freedom and the autonomy to choose your career and what you're wanting to do but then also to have people believe in you um and not kind of discourage make these discouraging comments but to really believe in your capabilities and and to do your capacity to do these things i think is a really powerful a powerful point so i see flavia has something to to add at this point is that right <laughs> yes i was just i just wanted um to say to that point really resonated with me about not being taught how to advocate for yourself and i think that's a very global thing that women experience you know i'm i'm originally from uganda and you know um a woman's role you know the men are always loud and boisterous and women are quiet um listening you know serving and so even after immigrating to the us and living here for most of my life that the way i grew up and sort of those lessons that i learned even though they weren't related necessarily to my professionalism applied and it took me a long time to really unlearn how to um be expected to just sit quietly and to learn to speak up and to and and a lot of that came from what you mentioned of have knowing that people are listening to you and that they they want to hear what you have to say and that your stories and your um points matter and i think people really undermine or underestimate how much those early childhood you know like teachings and what you see um echoed in your community and 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 people around you really impact how you later advocate for yourself in in all aspects of life personally and professionally so all these points are really really amazing and and i just want to give you guys kudos for being so young and already knowing this you know i'm 100 and i'm still learning so i'm i'm just really inspired thank you flavia that was a great summary and i think yeah points that we we carry with us for for the entirety of our lives i think no matter how old we get we we need that encouragement and that reinforcement and the the value that that we receive i think is really important i see tanya has something to share go ahead tanya yes um hi everyone um it's kind of a weird background going on on my video here but Um but what I wanted to say was what I have noticed here in Atlanta. Um I'm an international student here. I I I'm I'm from Zimbabwe originally and um 
one thing I have noticed, especially just in Atlanta itself, is the the over sexualization of women in the culture here in the in the U.S. It also has led to women um, being more even more harassed in in the workplace. Um, one thing that I noticed was because of uh, the high um, rates of uh, the cost of living here, women have had to not only women, everybody has had to work two jobs, three jobs to make ends meet. But for men, the jobs that they they work in are like trucking or uh, heavy lifting warehouses. Now, women can't really apply for those jobs and successfully get them because they're they're told they're too weak, and so in turn they just end up just being waitresses. And even now restaurants only hire women and they hire you based on your looks or your body and you always end up having to deal with um a lot of sexual harassment in in those jobs and and it's like if you do not deal with it then you're not going to make money and you're not going to have your rent money or your car payment or something so that's one thing that i have seen uh, over the past uh, few years uh, especially uh, post pandemic, a lot of people because you're working from home, they now have time to do other jobs. And for women, I noticed here, it's usually just restaurant serving and the serving is usually in very um, harassful, harassment uh, full places. And that's, yeah, that's just one thing I have noticed um, over the few, past few years for women in the workplace here. Thank you so much for raising that. It's such an important point. Um, and these, these barriers or these inequalities in the culture that is created can be so difficult to navigate. Um, but, but definitely, thank you for sharing that. So I don't know if there are others who are inspired to speak and share a perspective. It's been so wonderful to hear all of these different perspectives from different parts of the world on this review theme. And I think it's a, just such a wonderful primer as we're going into the commission to be thinking about not only our own experience, but also the lived experiences of others and how, how these principles kind of play out in our different contexts. So just really wanted to thank those who have shared today, have shared your experience and um, your vision for the future. Still wanted to give a little window if there was anyone who hasn't yet spoken, who might feel moved to share on any of these questions at this point. I don't know if our speakers, if Mushkan or Flavia have anything, any reactions or anything to share to wrap things up. I see Mercy has a hand. Over to you, Mercy. Yes, hello everyone. Um, well, uh, it, it, it was a pleasure actually to listen all of the stories that you shared today. But one thing that I would like to mention is the fact that sometimes we, uh, two things actually. Firstly, uh, what I have seen in the workforce post pandemic for women, you see that there is an expectation of working hours, of longer working hours, of responding emails and being in charge of work later at night. And I think this has affected mostly women, uh, myself included and what, what I started to do for myself set boundaries and then I shared it with all my colleagues who were single who were not married because especially in the cases when uh, you, you see that there are female colleagues who are single they have a tendency and the expectation that you know you can reply to us even later at night what are you doing you're just home staying you have no babies and I think um, I, I started sharing my story with other women's in my community and I was like don't let other people say that to you set boundaries for yourself and I think this is very important because sometimes we undermine this the role that people have and we expect that women can do anything but also we need to keep in mind that we have our limitations we have our life and we need to put a boundary between work and personal life uh, regardless of our marriage status and this is something that I have faced and I I really hope none of you has been in the same position, but I used my story to inspire other girls to not allow uh, for them to happen the same thing. Yeah, this is something I'd like to share. Thank you, Mercy. Yeah, great point, especially in the context of the pandemic. And despite our marital status, being able to set those boundaries um, and, and have that respect as a professional. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. That's a great point. 
So perhaps we can, I don't know if Mojgan or Flavia would like to offer any closing remarks, just wanted to give the opportunity to, if you would like to. Yeah, Sorry, yeah I'm just jumping thank in. You. I just wanted to say thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share and it's been wonderful hearing all your experiences. Um, and if anyone is interested to continue this conversation, I put my email in the chat. I'll put it again. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, I am involved in the youth space and gender equality. So I'd love to connect with you guys further. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, same. I'm going to put my email in here as well. And um, is it Marcy who had that last point? I don't know how you read my diary, but I just want to let you know you nailed it. And um, I want to reemphasize that you're your time, your personal time is your personal time. You don't have to validate it in order to um, have those boundaries. You don't have to have kids. You don't have to, or you can't have kids. You don't have to ex have an excuse for why your free time is yours. You know, it's, it's yours. And it's really, and I think it's really hard for women to sort of um, set those boundaries because we are expected to please. And, and there's also, we have different expectations for how we're allowed to, um, uh, what's considered uh, enough work for us, you know, and I think that they're, it's different for men and, and don't be afraid to set those boundaries. And I've, I've learned in my career that weirdly, the more I echo some of my male peers is sort of, um, you know, sometimes very blunt, you know, or <laughs> ways of being like, no, I'm not available. The more I'm actually respected the same way that they are. And the more I'm, the more apologetic I am and the more I make excuses about, please give me the time off, even though it's my free time, the more I am required to ask for that permission. So you kind of um, just keep that in mind. And, and I think that, you know, you guys are so young and like the, the future is just going to be better for you guys. So I'm, I'm really I'm really excited for everything I've heard today. And thank you for this opportunity. Beautiful. Thank you, Mojgan and Flavia, both for your thoughts and your words of wisdom. This is fantastic. Um, so I wanted to just pivot a little bit and ask kind of how everyone's doing in terms of preparation for the CSW. And really at the beginning, we kind of laid out all of the things that the Youth Leaders and Young Professionals Program is doing but we're really three weeks away. We have three more sessions together um, in this space, which is, is really a space to support, to raise some of these issues, to get our, our thoughts flowing and to share our experiences as we prepare for the commission. But wanted to just open up space. If anyone has any questions at this point about the CSW, um, if there's anything that you would like to see in the next three sessions that might help you in your preparation, this is the time to share and give us some feedback about how we can best support. So feel welcome to put things in the chat or raise your hand. Um, if you have a question or if you would like to request anything in our next three sessions before the Commission on the Status of Women begins um, on the 14th of March, but you know, NGO CSW has a consultation day um, that will happen the Sunday before. So on the 13th of March, things will really kick off and, and start moving. Um, but any questions um, about the CSW or any support that the YLYPs can offer as you're preparing? It looks like there's no hands. So I guess everyone's feeling ready and, and prepared to engage at the CSW. All right, so we can continue to um, connect in the chat, feel welcome to share. I see WhatsApp groups, I see emails, I see Slack channels, um, LinkedIn profiles, feel welcome to add those in the chat. We're really hoping that you are connecting with one another and reaching out. Um, so we can give a few minutes for that. Otherwise we can start to wrap up here. It's so wonderful to see you all and to hear from you. And thank you so much to our two speakers and to everyone who spoke and, and shared some reflections on the review theme for CSW. I don't know if Saida or Devin, there's anything else to add as we close out? I don't have anything else to add except that this was a great discussion. So thank you for our speakers and thank you to everyone who participated. Agreed. This was really amazing and it was so wonderful to hear all of your experiences and your work um, and looking forward to you next week. 
All right. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you same time next week. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.